You're about to watch a great interview on TYT interviews. If you want to watch them live, members are the only ones who get to do that. TYTnetwork.com slash join, become a member, enjoy the interviews as they happen. All right, we have a fascinating interview for you guys today. We're gonna talk to Adam Winkler, he's a a professor of law at UCLA. uh, And he almost literally wrote the book on the American Constitution uh, because he's the co-editor of the Encyclopedia of the American Constitution. Uh, Adam, great to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. All right, now your last book is, uh, the one that just came out is We the Corporations, How American Businesses Won Their Civil Rights. Man, I'm fascinated by that. Okay, so I want to dive in. And I want to let everybody know, I want to learn from Adam. And and there's, I'm sure, the great majority that we agree on. But even though he wrote the book on the Constitution, I'll probably disagree with him on one issue yeah. anyway. Because come on, who's gonna know better, a constitutional law professor or me? <laughs> okay, so, but before we get to that, let's learn, okay? Um, so let's talk about the history of it. How did corporations wind up having civil rights at all? Like at the very beginning, how did that concept begin? Because it, corporations are legal fictions and for a specific purpose. Um, they didn't have to have civil rights. How did it come about? Right, well, and the reason why I wrote this book is because there's been decisions like 2010 Citizens United, where the Supreme Court said corporations have the same free speech rights as individuals to spend their money on elections. And then there was the Hobby Lobby case where corporations were held to have religious freedom under a federal statute. And it occurred to me that corporations really have gained so many of our most fundamental rights. How did that happen? We know about the stories of how women and how minorities gained rights under the Constitution and fought for equal rights. Those are some of the most important stories we tell as Americans. Uh, But there's also been maybe a a little bit more of a disturbing or shocking story about how corporations have fought since America's earliest days to win equal rights too. And they don't protest in the street, but they have fought for 200 years in the Supreme Court to win landmark opinions and decisions extending our rights to them. Uh, I'm amused at the idea of waiting for the movie about how corporations won their civil rights, like, like Lincoln, right? And at the end, we all applaud, yes, finally, IBM and... Exxon Mobil also have their rights. Okay, now they don't do it that way, of course, because no one's actually on their side. Uh, Big business uh, polls worse than big media or even politicians. Now, nobody talks about that because media is big business and politicians are funded by big business. So (laughs) there's no one pushing that message, even though if you look at the polling, people are not fans. Um, And, uh, but they don't do, they don't need public support, they just need money. And influence. So, how did they start that process? Well, and that's one of the really interesting interesting things about uh, the corporate rights movement, if you will, is that corporations won their rights without having to convince Americans uh, that equal rights for corporations was a good idea. Whereas minorities and women had to fight in the streets, not just in the courts. Um, but corporations never needed we the people to side with them. All they needed really was the courts to side with them. And although we think of the Supreme Court in terms of liberal or conservative, over the course of American history, the story has been pretty much the same, which is that the justices are predominantly pro-business and they've corporations have taken advantage. And that's really the only audience they need to win fundamental rights. Yeah, so I, I talk a lot about that on the Young Turks. Uh, and if anything, it's gotten even more and more pro-corporate. You see the, the decisions from the Rehnquist Court, which actually nowadays would almost be considered liberal on the on the business issues, mm-hmm. uh, they were still predominantly, as far as I remember, pro corporations. But now this court is what at least seventy percent of the time they rule in in favor of big business, uh, and that's not an accident. Uh, my, for I know the the current day political climate and what has led to it. I'm super interested in the history. Current day, it's relatively straightforward. Corporations get to give to politicians. And so in my opinion, they buy off the politicians and then they tell the politicians, give me Supreme Court justices who are super pro business. And that's how you get Gorsuch. Gorsuch is the epitome of it. I will let you die on the side of the road if a corporation orders it. And that was him raising his hand saying, I'd like to be on the Supreme Court. And the Chamber of Commerce was like, that's our guy, that's our guy. And lo lo and behold, he's on the Supreme Court. But how did it start? So how did they, because back then they didn't, we didn't have the same financing system for our elections that we do now. 
So how do they get power within the courts? Well, we think about corporations exerting power by spending money on campaign finance or spending money on lobbying and access to public officials. And we think about their influence in the political branch. But there's also been a story about how corporations have really solidified their power and expanded it in the courts. And that in the few instances when businesses lose in the legislature, they can then use the Constitution in the courts to try to strike down those uh, those few laws that are passed restricting corporate behavior. And, and we think about the courts as sort of this neutral forum, you know, Lady Justice is blind with her scales that are evenly weighted. But the truth is the courts are a uniquely, uh, a unique forum that makes corporate power possible. That corporations can afford to finance risky lawsuits uh, if it's gonna help profits. They can afford to hire the best lawyers. Civil rights organizations traditionally struggled with financing and only could bring the best cases. Corporations can bring any case and just think of it as the cost of doing business. Right, so is it true that we started with the idea of corporations as people with a railroad executive that wasn't even a justice? Is that story true? Well, one of the most remarkable stories in the history of the Supreme Court is how corporations won rights under the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment was adopted after the Civil War to protect the rights of the newly freed slaves. But in the 1880s, the Southern Pacific Railroad Company, one of the biggest and most powerful corporations in America, filed a series of remarkable test cases, 60 of them in all, seeking expansive rights for corporations. And in one of those cases, the went to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court did not rule in favor of the Southern Pacific Railroad having constitutional rights, but the court's reporter of decisions, the bureaucrat who publishes the official volumes of the Supreme Court, wrote a summary in front of the opinion. And in the summary, he said the court had held that corporations have 14th Amendment rights. And that summary ends up getting cited for years to come by the Supreme Court and other courts for holding that corporations have the same rights as the newly freed slaves under the 14th Amendment. So that story has two interesting parts. One is, why did they hire a railroad executive to be their reporter? And I mean, were, did they not have the same selection process for Supreme Court justice back then? Because were they not like, oh, that's interesting that a really wealthy executive decides to be take a lowly job as a reporter for the Supreme Court, writes this thing in that it's monumentally important, ah, let's just let it slide. Like, well, isn't that weird? It is weird, but it's partly a, one of the things that historians always find that the world's so much different back in the day, and you don't imagine it to be. But at the time, the reporter of decisions back in the 1800s was actually a very illustrious position. It was back in the spoils era, where someone took a government position because of the money they could make by, by doing something. And in this case, it was you'd have the exclusive right to publish the official volumes of the Supreme Court. And so it was a very good money-making plum job. And a lot of illustrious people had that position in the 1800s. Uh, and this this particular reporter was a guy named J.C. Bancroft Davis, and it turns out he was a former railroad executive. Uh, and people have long speculated that perhaps he he wrote that inaccurate head note as a way of providing uh, greater protections for business corporations and the railroads in particular. I don't think that's much speculation. <laughs> He's a railroad executive who, at the time, as you point out, are looking to get extra rights in that era, and then he writes it in, in, in his summary. Okay, so that's an interesting point number one. The second is, why are we still listening to it? I mean, don't the Supreme Court justice know that? Why do they cite a summary that isn't part of the case? I mean, that's, it really is quite egregious. It is quite egregious, and what's happened is it's part of the reason why the court looked overlooked it for the 30 years afterwards was because the court moved into a period of its history where it was very business friendly and it was striking down laws regulating business left and right in the 1890s and early 1900s. So the court was business friendly and ultimately agreed with that uh, the reporter of decisions view of that case, um, even though the Supreme Court itself did not say that in, in the opinion. Um, and over the time, uh, basically again, we have such business friendly justices, there's really only been a few justices in the 100 years since that have really taken on that precedent. Uh, and there's never been a majority of the court that's ever been even close to doing so, even in the liberal Warren court eras. So if, if uh, a justice were to say, well, this precedent is clearly obviously wrong, do the other justices go, yeah, I don't care? Like, what, what's their answer? I mean, it's, it's not everyone knows, acknowledges if you know the history of uh, of the of the rulings and the Constitution, etc. That it wasn't in the heart of the so. So what did the Scalia's of the world go? I don't care. I just don't care. I'm gonna 
treat it as if it was in the actual decision? Well, the way it works is that because the way precedent works in the court is the first case was was decided based on a fraud, really. Mm -hmm. um, but then the second case had a majority of justices and they said, yeah, okay, we support that idea too. And then the next case, they have a majority of justices who support the idea too. The truth is, is there's never been a majority on the Supreme Court since the 1880s that seriously questioned whether corporations should have equal protection of the laws the same way uh, that the newly freed slaves uh, won after the Civil War. Yeah, I am in the camp of hell no, hell no. Okay, so we're gonna have an interesting conversation about that. But uh, more fun stories from the book, and uh, because everyone knows the Supreme Court is, uh, if nothing, fun. Um, <laughs> so uh, Roscoe Conkling, uh, a, a politician who deceived uh, the Supreme Court. What's that about? Well, this is part of that same series of test cases brought by the Southern Pacific Railroad. Uh, we talked about the second of their two cases, the one with the faulty reporter's uh, head note. Um, but there was a first case, and the first case involved this lawyer, Roscoe Conkling, who was an illustrious politician, a leader in Congress for about 20 years. He'd even been nominated and confirmed to the Supreme Court himself turning down the seat because he was making too much money as a lawyer for the railroads. Wow. Uh, and Conkling went to the court and he said that the 14th Amendment had been written to protect business corporations. And it was, <laughs> it was a bizarre, a laughable argument perhaps, but Conkling had been a drafter of the 14th Amendment himself when he was a young congressman many years earlier. Uh -huh. And so when he said this is what the framers of the 14th Amendment were intending, he was talking about his own experience and it had a lot of weight with the justices. No, I do remember uh, the Civil War fought on the grounds of, well, can we finally free the corporations? <laughs> Pretty sure that wasn't the case, but uh, but you know this whole story is gi giving me the sense, and, and nobody's going to be surprised by this, that people just agree to whatever they want to agree to, whether it makes sense, it's a laughable proposition or not. Civil War about the was fought, and then hence the amendments, 13th, 14th, and 15th were about freeing the corporations, come on. Who could possibly believe that unless you have a financial interest in believing that? So uh, that's fascinating. So you know, I have a side note here and I'll run it by you. Uh, I have a thesis that, um, that the commonly held belief that if you were not born in the country, uh, you cannot run for president is incorrect. Because that isn't a part of the constitution that was amended by the 14th amendment, giving everyone the same rights, okay? Mm -hmm. And so that would amend the earlier part of the Constitution. Slaves were not citizens born of in the United States. They were not natural born citizens, let's put it that way, right? And they could run for president. So how do you like my theory? I actually think it's an interesting theory, one I haven't heard before. And you know, whenever I come up on a new constitutional theory, uh, then I'm particularly interested. But the, the idea of the Constitution is that uh, amendments that come later should change and alter the previous provisions, the provisions that were adopted earlier. And one provision is on the presidency and is restricting the presidency to people who are natural born citizens. And perhaps the 14th Amendment, which requires equal protection for all persons regardless of whether they're citizens or not, should suggest that someone who is not a citizen might be able to run for president. Right, uh, I, I and Ted Cruz should at least have the same rights as corporations. Because uh, I was not born in the country and neither was Ted Cruz. And they let him run for president. Um, okay, so back, back to the main issue at hand. Apparently a politician who uh, focused on fake news also gave right, uh, accidentally gave further rights to corporations and specific media corporations. Who was that? I'm pretty sure it was not Donald Trump, and, uh, and and what happened? Well, it was Huey Long, who was the iron-fisted demagogue uh, who ran Louisiana back in the 1930s. And Huey Long was Trump before Trump. He was an unabashed, outspoken, aggressive populist who won election on the eve of the Great Depression, promising to make Louisiana great again. Uh, and uh, when the newspapers opposed his agenda, he accused the newspapers of publishing fake news. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. But uh, <laughs> and he literally he said uh, that uh, you know the the tax that he imposed on newspapers should be should be called a tax on lying, two cents per lie. Um, and the newspapers challenged that tax in court, uh, but the law at the time was really on long side, and the Supreme Court had really read the freedom of the press clause very narrowly. But in this case, the newspaper corporations convinced the justices to read the freedom of the press clause much more broadly and provide much greater protection for freedom of the press. And the court said corporations are entitled to make that claim too and claim that right of freedom of the press 
Um, today, newspapers are, in a modern society, key to checking the government and encouraging democratic deliberation, and they're published by newspaper corporations, and so for-profit corporations must have some First Amendment rights, the court said. That's interesting, I'm not a fan of corporations having constitutional rights, but that is a tough argument to get past because freedom of the press almost by definition refers to a corporation. Because an individual would have a hell of a time putting together a media organization to qualify under a press. They would have freedom of speech, but that's different, it literally says freedom of the press. And there are questions about whether that freedom is freedom for an institutional press, like the press, or is it freedom for an activity, publishing your materials? And, and the Supreme Court's been a little ambiguous about that over the years. But it's one of the really hard questions. If you say that corporations have no rights, well, that means the New York Times company has no rights. And that means that if uh, you know, we saw the Pentagon Papers, there was this popular movie out this past year, The Post, about the Washington Post's uh, effort to uh, publish the Pentagon Papers. Well, again, if corporations have no rights, then that movie never happens because the Washington Post can't publish the, that material. It doesn't have the freedom of the press. So it's a difficult question when thinking about the rights of corporations. Well, okay, so that, that goes to our disagreement. So let's, let's have at it. Okay, so um, my, my uh, argument is that no, no, of course corporations have rights. They have the rights that we give them. They are legal fictions, so we give them rights as a matter of law. Um, but they have no constitutional rights. They are not endowed by their creator with any inalienable rights, we're their creator. Uh, and, and so I don't see any need for constitutional rights. That their rights should be specifically, and I would argue obviously, limited to the ones we have given them. Mm. Well, it's a great point, and I think it shares, it's a, a view that's very commonly held, and I think uh, reflected my view before writing the book. Um, and, and it's not an unreasonable point of view at all. Uh, I think that one of the problems with it is, is that if corporations have no rights, that means they have no property rights either under the Constitution. It means that if the government wants to seize, this building and sees the Google's campus and build a highway through it, they can do that and not pay a dime of compensation. Well, let me make two arguments about that. Well, number one, if we wanted to, we can give them specific property rights. So it doesn't have to be constitutional rights or natural rights. Uh, we could simply write that into the law. And number two, uh, that is where you actually could argue, no, you are taking shareholder uh, property away if you seize Google's campus. So there you wouldn't need Google to have property rights because it is owned by shareholders which themselves have property rights. Well, but it's more complicated. I mean, the, the property is owned by Google, the company. The shareholders have no claim to it individually. They can't purchase it, they can't force it to be liquidated, right? I mean, they are really- But it is a percentage of their property, right? It is- I mean, they own it, shares in it, you know, mm -hmm. they own shares, but uh, but they don't own the property of the corporation. They only own shares in the corporation, and it's a slightly different thing. Uh, and But is even if we get beyond property rights, you have First Amendment rights. I mean, the, the newspaper companies that took on Huey Long. Well, I'm sure Huey Long would not provide statutory protections for those newspaper companies. He would try to censor them. And mm -hmm. I think Donald Trump with the Republicans in Congress, if they really wanted to, if corporations had no rights, you could imagine them going going after the New York Times. So um, here's the argument I would make there, and I and I grant uh, everyone watching that I've got a dog in the fight because <laughs> I run a media corporation. But that would seem to me the only enumerated constitutional right of a corporation within the Constitution. Because press, almost by definition, has to be a company, and they actually wrote that in. So that's a constitutional right that already existed. Possibly, so one view in a popular, like I said earlier, it's not clear that the freedom of the press clause is a freedom for the press in terms of the institutional press and whether that makes sense of going forward in a society with tweeting and all this other stuff happening. Um, or it's a freedom for uh, an activity, the, the ability to publish your material. And if it's ability to publish your material, then it's not really a special right for corporations. Um, I think there's a good argument that it should be thought of as a special right for the institutional press. I think there's there's uh, something to that. but you know. So it, the issues are numerous, so uh, recently um, the FBI wanted to force Apple to open up an iPhone of a suspected terrorist. Well, if Apple has no due process rights under the Constitution, then they can't stop the government from just coming in and forcing them to do this. And, and so the reason why they can stop is because they have some judicial protection. So uh, I think these are very, very difficult issues in terms of imagining how, what rights or what protections corporations should have. But I think it's fair to say that whether it's by statute or by Constitution, there's at least some basic 
protections that corporations should have. But at the same time, they shouldn't have all the same rights that you and I yeah. have. And I think the Supreme Court's gone wrong by granting corporations the same political speech rights and Citizens United and the same religious freedom rights that you and I might have in a case like Hobby Lobby. Right, so um, you know, I, I know that folks in Washington think I'm radical left, right? But in reality, I, I happen to think I'm in the middle. And uh, you know, obviously a progressive, no question about that. But uh, I don't want corporations to have the right to buy our politicians. On the other hand, I run a corporation. So it's not like I don't want corporations to have any rights. It's crazy, otherwise they wouldn't exist, they would be pointless. Right, they by definition they must have some rights. They're you know the ones that I think should be enumerated by statute as we discussed. So the idea of taking away all rights from corporations is almost nonsensical. Uh, the question is, what do we mean by rights, and is it by statute or by constitution? Um, so and I think that those, if we're having a rational conversation, which I think you and I are, but the rest of the political landscape is not necessarily doing that. Um, that we could get to a point where we go, okay, yeah, those are the rights they should have, and those are the ones they shouldn't have. But right now, um, it's a situation where it's not a rational discussion. It's uh, I have given you all your campaign donations, and I've done independent expenditures for you, and here's my list of justices that I like. Right? Is there any hope other than an amendment for rolling that back? I think there is hope in the long run for rolling it back, but it's not going to happen in the short run. I mean, this past election, the presidential election, was really a turning point on this issue in particular because uh, the court was split five, uh, four, four, and uh, whether it was Justice Garland or Justice Gorsuch was really going to really control the outcome of a lot of these corporate rights cases. I think if uh, Justice Garland was on the court instead of Justice Gorsuch, there's a good chance that Citizens United would be overturned. I think that there's cases before the Supreme Court this term, for instance, this masterpiece cake shop case about a Colorado baker that refused to bake a wedding cake for a same-sex couple. And the, that's also a corporate rights question. Does the bakery have to provide equal services to every customer or can it pick and choose based on the religious views of the owner? Uh, and, and I think that uh, that's another case that's likely to come out five to four in favor of the corporation. Uh, whereas if there had been a Garland on the court instead of a Gorsuch, maybe that comes out five four the other way. So I think the court can shift and these, these cases can, some of these mistakes can be revised. But it's going to take a while before the court is populated with people with the right views uh, on these issues to, to do that. Yeah, well, let's so let's tackle that a little bit because I'm very, very skeptical of that. First of all, Garland voted with uh, in favor of Citizens United. I understand it was precedent. He was a lower court uh, judge, and but there are people who voted in the opposite direction. So he didn't have to vote in, in the way that he did. So I was skeptical that he was. And Obama and Clinton f bragged about how they would point justices who were pro-business. So, and, and once you have the financial incentive in place, it's very hard to undo that. So I just can't, and I certainly can't see a court saying, we're undoing Citizens United plus Buckley v. Vallejo, plus uh, Bilotti, plus the railroad case. You see what I'm saying? Is that anywhere near conceivable? I think it's conceivable, but like I said, it's not going to happen in the near term. And you know, it shows the importance of these presidential elections to try to change that somewhat. But like you say, both the parties are pretty beholden now to corporate interest at this point. And you do get a lot of business friendly justices. And in some ways, that's kind of a return to the norm, if you will, in that if we look at American history, that's generally been the case. And it's often been these corporate rights cases have often come from liberal courts like the New Deal and Warren Court eras, where the court expanded the rights of corporations and gave them more of the liberty rights that we think should be just for individuals. And, and why is that? Is because they were just as a progressives interested in expanding civil rights overall? Was that the, the, the driving reason in those eras? I think it got tied up with other issues. So we think about the freedom of the press case. You know, that's a New Deal era court, a, a court that's uh, becoming liberal, that's trying to expand liberal protections, the right to free speech uh, against government censorship. Um, and so that's a liberal goal that's just very tied up with the rights of corporations. In the 1950s, I found there was an interesting case uh, involving the NAACP, uh, where 
Uh, Alabama tried to put the NAACP out of business after the NAACP won uh, the uh, Brown versus Board of Education school desegregation case. Of course, the NAACP is not a business, but the Alabama used the fact that it was a corporation, a nonprofit corporation, to try to put it, uh, to stop it from running and filing lawsuits. And that leads to a big Warren court case where the Supreme Court says, uh, corporations like the NAACP have freedom of association, uh, a right that then will be used by business corporations later to expand their own rights. Mm -hmm. And how about uh, Ralph Nader? How did he accidentally uh, help the cause of corporations, which is a great irony. Right, well, one of the things we find is that corporations are very good at leveraging progressive reform to serve the ends of capital. Uh, and a perfect example of that is Ralph Nader in the 1970s. Ralph Nader at the time was the height of his popularity as a consumer rights advocate, and he took a case to the Supreme Court um, on behalf of consumers who are trying to get um, uh, better advert uh, free, ad free up advertising for pharmaceutical uh, drugs so that they could get the best prices. Uh, and they end up winning in the Supreme Court. And the theory that Nader argues is because he's representing consumers is that the First Amendment protects the rights of consumers, listeners, people who hear the speech, not just the right of speakers, but also the right of listeners. Well, that's the theory that the Supreme Court uses in Citizens United. and says, well, regardless of the identity of the speaker, whether it's a corporation or not, uh, this political speech is protected because we need to protect the rights of the listeners, the, the people who would hear that speech. And so they use Ralph Nader's theory to empower corporations uh, even more. What do you think of Citizens United? Because as I hear uh, legal theories like that, I, I find it so laughably preposterous. So uh, uh, it's my right that they are protecting for the Koch brothers to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to manipulate me. That's, and they're just looking at, the Supreme Court's looking out for me, right? And they say that it does not even give the appearance of corruption. That's also seems preposterous to the average person. I think the factual premises of a case like Citizens United do seem preposterous to most people. The idea that this, that this money is not corrupting unless it's highly coordinated with a candidate or the fact that corporations spending money is nothing to worry about when the truth is, is corporations, because of the legal form, have the ability to amass resources that individuals like us, we could never do. Um, and so uh, it's a kind of false equality that the court approaches uh, with these issues. I think Citizens United is wrongly decided and in part for the reasons that President Obama Obama said in his famous State of the Union speech that uh, made so many headlines at the time is that for a hundred years we have imposed special rules on corporations in the political process. Uh, a story that ties to Teddy Roosevelt in the antitrust era uh, that I talk about in the book. Uh, and, and that reflected a balance. Yes, we do have corporate power in America and corporations have a lot of strength in the legislature and in regulatory agencies and also in the courts. But we said, you know what, we're not gonna let them spend their money directly on elections. That's really, that wall has come down and now corporations really are freed up to spend much more money than ever before. And obviously, any rational corporation will go and purchase politicians because it's a great return on investment. You'd be crazy not to, and it would leave you vulnerable. You would be violating your fiduciary responsibility if you didn't go and basically bribe politicians now that it's legal. Well, that's the situation we've created. The corporations themselves have are operated by these fiduciary principles that require executives to take those steps that are in the interests of the business and the long-term profitability for shareholders. Um, and yet, at the same time, they have all these rights, uh, the rights of citizens. Um, and, and so what the, this means is that they end up uh, really having almost an obligation to fight in court against laws that restrict their, uh, their uh, autonomy and claim constitutional rights. And they almost have a legal obligation to try to buy politicians and to get as much as they can because that makes good business sense. Uh, and so we've created this kind of Frankenstein's monster, if you will, that can now govern over its creators. Well, I think we're in a science fiction movie. You know, all those movies of the machines versus the people, right? Well, we have those machines, they're called corporations. Mm -hmm. They don't look like a robot, but they act like a robot. They're, sometimes people on the left will get mad and they say they're immoral. No, they're amoral. A corporation is not a person in reality. It's not a human being. It is a program, it's a code. And, and, and the code that we wrote is maximize profit, period. Don't not worry about the citizens, not worry about the consumers or your employees. Maximize profit, end of code, right?
And then we wrote another code in the Supreme Court that said you can now spend money on politicians. Okay, and then that's it. There goes your democracy. It's gone. <laughs> so, and and you know, look, you've probably heard it. You guys have probably heard it. Certainly, if you watch me, you've heard it. The Princeton study over 20 years, and this was pre Citizens United, studied 1,800 policy positions. No correlation. Public opinion and public policy have zero correlation. Okay, so that is not a democracy. And instead, what we have is, and it showed top 10% more likely to be donors. Direct correlation to policy. And that is the result of these Supreme Court cases. And so that's why the book is so interesting. And so um, let me ask you more about it. Uh, so I know that my turned out minority groups like NAACP ironically or you know wittingly or unwittingly fought for corporate rights, right? Did it ever go in reverse? Did corporations ever fight for minority rights? Um, well, there are times where the fight for corporate rights did benefit individuals, right? So this is not just a story of corporations gaining power over individuals, although that's a big part of the story to be sure. Um, corporations have been innovators in constitutional law. That same pursuit of profit that leads corporations to be at the vanguard of the economy have also, has also led corporations to be at the vanguard of constitutional law sometimes. So uh, corporations have been uh, devised innovative civil rights litigation strategies and implemented them years later would be copied by the NAACP and other civil rights groups like things like test cases and getting all star dream teams of lawyers and uh, various kinds of ways of thinking about constitutional Constitutional arguments um, devised by corporations. And uh, I found surprisingly, one of the most surprising things I found in writing the book was that if you look at a course of, over the course of American history, corporations have often been at the forefront of many constitutional rights. We talked earlier about the freedom of the press, it's a good example. It's not the only one. There's a bunch of rights that were first given life in cases that were brought by business corporations. And only after that did individuals kind of win those rights too. Mm -hmm. Well, again, it makes sense based on what you were explaining earlier, which is they have a lot of money. So they can, it's easy for them to afford a dream team of lawyers to, to go in there and fight for all their rights. And then around the edges, we can benefit depending on the, on the situation, right? Uh, so they came up with that even before OJ did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, and now um, you, you write about the founders a little bit. I wanna go back to the beginning. Um, what did the founders think of corporations? Well, there, there's no evidence that the founders wanted the Constitution to protect the rights of business corporations too. In fact, the founders had a certain hostility towards business corporations. You take the Boston Tea Party for, for example, we think of that as a protest against the British government. It was really a protest against the British government and the most powerful corporation in the world at the time, the East India Company, because the East India Company had uh, received this big bailout from Britain that gave them the right to sell tea in the colonies for the first time without American middlemen. So the Boston Tea Party was a revolt of merchants who were being cut out of the tea trade. And they went and they dumped that tea overboard that night because it belonged to the East India Company. It was a corporate protest, uh, uh, not just a protest against the British government. And so corporations uh, were not favored by the founders, uh, but it didn't take long. Uh, the first Supreme Court case on the rights of business corporations uh, came in 1809, a full half century before the first Supreme Court cases on the rights of women and racial minorities. Hmm. So as you were describing the Boston Tea Party, I thought, you know what we would say about the people who did that these days? We'd call them Antifa, right? Destroying property because they didn't agree with a corporation. We would say they were radicals and dangerous, etc. Well, it turns out they were radicals. They did a revolution. <laughs> just, just our kind of radicals. That's right. I hadn't thought about that connection, but, but it does highlight that that when we think about American, we think about America sort of this corporate capitalist democracy, and the framers didn't think of it in quite those same terms. They were, they were men of property and men of money and men of wealth, but they didn't imagine our corporate democracy in quite the way we have it today. I, I think I remember reading a lot of hostile quotes about corporations from the founding fathers. That's right, the framers were had a lot of hostility towards corporations. But like everything, when you look back at the history, it's kind of complicated. Especially the, the founders were the wealthiest men in America at the time. Uh, and it turns out that in the, the first 10 years uh, uh, between 1790 and 
1800, there was a huge growth in the number of business corporations that were formed. And nearly all of our favorite founding fathers, from Washington to Jefferson to Madison, etc., all of them ended up being stockholders. They ended up purchasing stock in these corporations. And when they died, they all had a tremendous amount of stockholding. And indeed, the Chief Justice who wrote the first Supreme Court case protecting the rights of business corporations, John Marshall, turns out he was just a major stockholder in almost mm. all of the big corporations of the time. All right, say it with me, guys. Of course, it always goes back to financial incentives. And if you have a really wealthy head of the Supreme Court who owns all that stock, he's gonna want corporations to have a little bit more power. So uh, that makes sense. I did, I, now that you're here, and it's so uh, relevant in the news today, I also wanna talk about your earlier book, sure. uh, Gunfight. And so it's still on the same topic of the Constitution, obviously your expertise. Um, and, and I have my own questions about the Second Amendment as well. So your book has been described as very moderate, uh, and you recognize both sides of the arguments that, that there are really gun rights, and that, but they have been regulated and limited in the past. So um, again, I take a slightly different position. Um, I don't know why we're not reading the first clause of the Constitution. So I used to be a Republican, and there's some vestiges of that left, very little, right? Probably because the Republican Party went so nuts. And so, but uh, but ideally, I'd like to balance budgets. And but one of the real vestiges left is that I'm conservative, not politically, but uh, legally. So I don't mind the, the idea of original intent, but the original intent of the Second Amendment, I think that it, you know, so I actually think Roe versus Wade was decided wrong, for example. I think it's great legislation, uh, but it's a little tough to pick that, those, that out about the three trimesters out of the Constitution. I'm just giving you background on that context. But if you're in that conservative legal realm, shouldn't you read the Second Amendment and go, you're not in a militia, we're done with this. You don't have any gun rights. It's one of the great mysteries and the Heller case, which was the Supreme Court decision in 2008 that was the first Supreme Court case to read the Second Amendment to protect an individual right to bear arms unambiguously, was written by Justice Scalia, the great originalist who was famous for making originalism the, the centerpiece of constitutional interpretation. Uh, and he had to really jump through hoops to get around that phrase, uh, that uh, a well-regulated militia being necessary for the security of a free state is how the Second Amendment begins and, uh, and indeed he kind of in his opinion, kind of says, well, that's kind of explains why we thought about the right to bear arms, but doesn't define the scope of the right to bear arms. Um, I don't have a problem with reading the right to bear arms broader outside of the military context, in part because I'm not an originalist. I don't believe that we have to stick with the original understanding of the Constitution. But it does seem pretty clear uh, that when the Second Amendment was framed, the framers were thinking about it primarily in military terms. Yeah, so again, it feels like the Supreme Court, who we really respect and we view as like these really brilliant justices, etc., they just decided to agree upon a fiction. It clearly referred to a militia. The historical context was a militia. The original intent was a militia. There are no more militias. It should be to, it's, it should be like the Third Amendment. We don't quarter troops anymore because that's not a thing, right? We don't have gun rights anymore because we don't have militias anymore. It's not a thing. So they're both antiquated. So why do we keep insisting on things that are clearly not true? Well, I think it's part of the nature of uh, the judicial process. And it's, I don't think the justices think of it as not true, but they think of the Constitution as embodying certain values. And the idea is how do you keep those values vibrant in today's society? Uh, and that means breaking from the original intent of the framers often. I think you can't have equal protection of the laws in American society today if LGBT people can't marry. Um, the framers of the 14th Amendment, when they wrote the Equal Protection Clause, they were thinking of the newly freed slaves. They weren't thinking about corporations and they weren't thinking about LGBT people either. Mm -hmm. um, and so they weren't protecting that right to marriage. But I think the way that you can't, you, I think we can't, the principle that they adopted, that we will have equal protection of the laws, cannot be fulfilled without giving LGBT people the right to vote. Yeah, but I, I mean, would, the right to marry. So. But I would argue, and that's why when I say original intent, it's, uh, as I explained, it's not exactly my judicial philosophy because. The plain language matters. Equal protection uh, under the law is by definition broad. It's written as incredibly broad. It's supposed to apply to everyone, right? And I don't care if you thought in your head, oh, I only wanted to apply to freed slaves. I don't want it to apply later to other people to make them equal. Well, then you shouldn't have written it that way, right? But in the case of the Second Amendment, 
It's super clear, it's not broad. It is by definition not broad. It says for a militia, for a militia. So I just like I didn't I wanted to make sure I wasn't missing anything. I'm not missing anything. It does say that it is a qualifier. We've just decided to ignore it. Well, what this what the Justice Scalia said in the Heller case was that uh, when the framers referred to the militia, they were referring to basically all able-bodied citizens. And so the citizen it wasn't a restricted group like the National Guard. And there's some basis in history, right? I mean, we know that we learn in school about the Minutemen, you know, we're gonna go home, grab your guns, be ready to fight in an instant. Um, that's sort of the legend of the revolution. Well, you couldn't go home and grab your guns if you didn't have a gun at home, right? And so the, mm -hmm. the, the framers believed in a citizen's militia, an army of we the people. Uh, it's not a belief that we still have anymore in quite the same way. So it doesn't quite make the same sense yeah, as it once did. It, I hear you and those, that's all great, but it says well-regulated militia. <laughs> you, you're dead by definition not well-regulated if you gotta go home and grab a random gun. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that the Second Amendment, that principle of a well-regulated militia, though, is one that we should recognize does even in today. That if the militia is we the people who are capable of, uh, of possessing firearms and fighting for the nation, we can't ignore that well-regulated language. And too often the NRA has been selling us a story about the Second Amendment that says you have a right to bear arms and any gun control is unconstitutional or questionable. The truth is things like background checks, restrictions on military style rifles, restrictions on high capacity magazines, uh, none of those things are unconstitutional on, under the Second Amendment. So to what degree did the uh, founding fathers refer, were they referring to the slave patrols in the South when they said well regulated militia? So I know that there were other militias in the North that had nothing to do with slave patrols, but uh, is that, is that, is that also right or is that a, a, a myth or what, what? No, that's right in the sense that militia, one of the use of militias, militias were used to defend the, na defend the nation. If there were hostile native tribes you needed to fight against or hostile Brits coming in, you needed to fight them. That's what the militia was for. Militia was also for capturing slaves, escaped slaves. Remember at the time there was no police force. In America, uh, the town did not have any police. Might have a constable, a police officer, but did not have a police force. And so, law enforcement was really up to the people. You heard about the hue and cry. Well, if there was a crime in the 1790s, someone would cry out, "Hey, someone just committed a crime!" And the people of the town would gather to try to go and try to find out what happened. And uh, and, and the militia was a, a key part of that law enforcement process. So, in the South when escaped slaves was one of the big offenses to the law that they wanted to combat, they used their militias. And by the time of the Civil War, really the militias had become effective only as slave patrols. And that by the 100 years into American history, they're no longer used for military fighting. They're really only for capturing freed slaves. Oh, that's interesting. Or escaped slaves. So around what date is are the militias only slave patrols? Well, it start, that starts to happen right after the War of 1812. So the War of 1812, if you remember your history lesson, right, Britain mm -hmm. decides to refight the Revolutionary War and almost wins the second mm -hmm. time. Um, and part of the reason they almost win is because states don't send their militias to fight the, against the Brits. Massachusetts, for instance, says we're not sending our militia, we don't believe in this war. Mm -hmm. um, and so after the War of 1812, we realize, hey, we need a standing army. We're, we're, we're gonna be a world power. We need to be, have an army to protect ourselves. And so the citizens militia falls out for the most part uh, as a military fighting force, uh, replaced by a standing army and then the National Guard. Uh, but in the South, the militias hang on because they still have this purpose, which is to go go get free, uh, escape slaves and bring them home. Yep, okay, so now let's go uh, uh, to the idea of an amendment. Um, now, on, on the Second Amendment, you don't need an amendment because it says a well-regulated militia. So if I were gonna write an amendment to the Second Amendment, I'd write it just like it is. <laughs> I'd, have, I'd put a qualifier in there saying only for a well-regulated militia. So that one is, is clear, I, at least to I think me and rational people, fairly clear. Um, now on the back to the issue of, uh, of corporations. <laughs> now I would argue for an amendment that says uh, a number of things and maybe s different amendments. So for example, I, I would want uh, an amendment to end the private financing of elections and to do public financing. So first off, uh, on that issue, it doesn't, it's not as pertinent to the book on corporations, but there's no, there's no issues there, right? That doesn't create any other consequences that, that could be problematic. No, we could have such a constitutional provision, and it would be very sensible to have such a constitutional provision. I, you know, it's all about, uh, you know, the band's going to play the songs that the person who's paying them wants to hear. 
Uh, mm -hmm. And that's what we have in American politics. So having a kind of public financing would be a good idea. Uh, we need broader changes in how the Constitution's read in terms of campaign finance law, so we don't, so corporations don't have the power to then just spend independently and spend as much money as they want. That's part of the problem with today's system is that although we have public financing in a couple states, the Supreme Court has said that corporations can come in and spend as much money as they want in those states as long as they don't coordinate with the candidate. Well, that's why, you know, in my ideal world, and I don't know that we get my ideal world, and it's a collaborative process if you're gonna get 38 states, including a lot of Republican states to, to ratify an amendment. Um, I would say not only do you do public financing, but you also end corporate person. You have to turn off the faucet. And so if they have constitutional rights, they're always going to be able to say, well, I got a right to speak. And, and, the, and the Supreme Court says, Money speech, so yeah, have your cute little public financing. I'm gonna put a billion dollars in independent expenditures in. Well, it's why it's very important that those who are promoting a 28th Amendment to the Constitution, an idea that would either end corporate personhood or allow good campaign finance laws, maybe public financing, have to really think through how that amendment is going to be applied in practice because we want a constitutional amendment that articulates, like the previous ones, broad and important principles about democracy and about individual dignity. Um, at the same time, we need someone, uh, an amendment that's detailed enough so that it solves these important problems and closes these loopholes that the Supreme Court has built in. But uh, I do think you're, uh, there is a certain intuition you have of pessimism and cynicism uh, that whatever amendment you apply, you adopt, corporations are gonna try to take advantage of it. I think my book provides excellent support for your intuition. <laughs> yes, and so, uh, and I know that an amendment is, by the way, not the end, it's the beginning. Uh, then you have to have enabling legislation, and then after that, you have to be ever vigilant. Because unless you change the, the coding of the uh, corporations themselves, which we should consider, right? Because other countries do put other parts in. They say you do have to actually care about citizens, uh, and but we don't have that. So until we change that and we say maximize profit, by hook or by crook, by the Supreme Court or by legislatures, they will try to maximize profit. And capturing the Supreme Court and the Congress is a very logical extension of that. That's right, I just did an event a couple weeks ago and the person I was on an event on a panel with, his name is Kent Greenfield, a professor at Boston College Law School. And he's got a book coming out about this issue too. And his argument is that corporations are people and they should start behaving like it too. And his answer is that is not opposed to corporate personhood, but his answer is we don't need to change the constitution or change corporate personhood. What we need to do is change the nature of our corporations and make them so that they're not these profit maximizing automatons that are, like you said, just another computer technology technology uh, that are devoted to this sort of slavishly towards one principle. That maybe what we need to think of is about democratizing our corporations too. All right, Adam Winkler, uh, law professor at UCLA. The book is We the Corporations, How American Businesses Won Their Civil Rights. Thank you so much. Really Thanks for having it. me. All right. If you liked this interview and you're at the end, so apparently you liked it a little bit, thank you for watching, we really appreciate it. You can watch them live as they happen if you're a member, only members get that. Go to tytnetwork.com slash join and you get not only interviews live, you get the Young Turks live, you get Aggressive Progressive live, old school and all the commercial free. Come join us right now, tytnetwork.com slash join.